Hi, I've got two, actually 201. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Finance Government Operations Committee, FGOC committee meeting. To, I want to go to, to order. This time I am auto lead chair of this committee along with Vice Chair Supervisor Susan Ellenberg. With both presents, I, we now have a quorum. And so first uh, item on the agenda is our public comment. Um, this item is reserved for members of the public to address the committee on any items not on this agenda, and any public who wish to address the committee on items not on the agenda should request to speak at this time. Clerk, would you please let us know how many speakers we have for public comment? We currently do not have any speakers in person or on Zoom. All right. I'll give it five, four, three, <laughs> two, one. Last call. Okay. That's it, right? Okay, go ahead and close the public comment period. That makes it easy. Let's go move to the third item, which is to approve the consent calendar and changes to the committee's agenda. Item three on the agenda is approval of the agenda and changes to the consent. Supervisor Ellenberg, um, just want to check in you. What do you have? I would like to recommend that we move items six, seven, eight, and 10 to consent. Additionally, I would like to hold item 13 and 14. Uh, 13 is the ARPA item. We're going to be getting more information uh, on that soon. And 14 on boards and commissions. Um, just posted uh, within the last number of hours, which I will say is a little bit frustrating. I know that sometimes uh, everybody is working very quickly, and this was a board meeting week, but, but this in particular is an item that we've been asking for for quite a while. Um, so just a reminder and plea for everyone to please get, um, get ledge files in um, when the agenda is published, please. Thank you. Okay, and uh, let's see. I actually would like to first uh, remove items 20 and 21 from the consent calendar and add them to the top of the agenda. Item 20 is the management audit of the e Employment Services Division of the Department of Employment and Benefit Services Department from the Management Audit Division. And the second one is item 21, which is the management audit of the Consumer Protection Unit of Office of District Attorney from the Management Audit Division. So those two items I would like to um, get it back to our agenda and actually put on the top. And in addition, I'd like to request that item 11 be placed on the consent calendar. Item 11 is a quarterly report from the Social Services Agency, Department of Aging, and Adult Services relating to the in-house supportive services call center and overdue as reassessments. Uh, I would like to next report to re the, the next report to include the progress on each of the approaches listed um, to completing these assessments. Um, and those are the couple of changes I have. Um, so right now, it looks like I'm confirming we have items 6, 7, 8, 10, and 11 being proposed to put on consent. Item 13 and 14 are being held. And item 20 and 21 is being moved from consent to the regular agenda. That's your motion. I'm happy to second it. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to open the public hearing. Any in the public would like to talk about all these changes on the consent? <laughs> We currently do not have any speakers in person or on Zoom. All right, thank you very much. So I'm going to close the public hearing on that and let's go take a vote. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg? Yes. And Chairperson Lee? Yes as well, thank you. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and deal with the couple of items I pulled, uh, which is item 20, first and 21, which is 20 is receiving the management audit of the Employment Services Division of the Department of Employment and Benefits Services Department from the Management Audit Division. And here to present is our Management Audit Manager, Cheryl Soloff, and your team. Go ahead, Cheryl. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have here with me um, Severin Campbell, who was the project manager for the Management Audit of the Department of Employment and Benefits Services. And I also have with me Dan Goncher, who was the uh, project manager for the district attorney's uh, CPU audit. Great, thank you. And with that, I'll ask Severin to um, go over our brief presentation on uh, the Debs audit. 
Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair Lee, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg. I'm Severin Campbell from the Management Audit Division. Um, so this is a very brief overview of the audit of Deb's uh, employment services. Next slide. Um, so just as an overview of the um, audit, we looked at the programs that are covered by employment services. This is welfare to work, GA vocational services, child care assistance, housing access, uh, access to behavioral health services, and domestic violence prevention services. Next, next slide, please. <laughs> next slide, please. Okay. So the audit had um, eight findings and 14 recommendations. Um, the, the findings and recommendations were related to improving CalWORKs clients' access to employment and subsidized employment, improving employment outcomes, uh, better coordination or continued coordination of welfare to work programs with the county's workforce development boards, evaluating alternatives to the county's existing general assistance um, work requirements, their vocational ex uh, services program, increasing CalWORKs clients' access to housing, to behavioral health services, and domestic violence prevention services, improving the review process for child care payments, and preparing for the return to in-person contact with CalWORKs clients, which was to begin this summer. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the uh, responses to the audit, 13 recommendations were directed to the Social Services Agency. The Social Services Agency director agreed with 12 recommendations and partially agreed with one recommendation. The Office of Support of Housing director also responded to three recommendations that were specific to uh, housing services provided to CalWORKs clients. Uh, and in this case, they agreed with two recommendations and partially agreed with one recommendation. And then the Behavioral Health Services Department Director provided a written response that was really discussing the finding uh, on the county's contract with Health Alliance to provide behavioral health services to CalWORKs clients. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the recommendations was directed to the chair of the Health and Hospital Committee and this was to request quarterly reports from the Department of Employment and Benefits Services Director and Behavioral Health Services Director on assigning Health Alliance staff at CalWORKs locations. Uh, during the course of the audit, uh, all of the contact between Health Alliance and CalWORKs clients was um, generally remote. Um, in screening and enrolling clients in Health Alliance services, uh, these reports should identify barriers to screening and enrollment and steps taken to reduce those barriers. Um, so that's just a very brief summary. I'm available for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me ask uh, my colleague. Um, yes, uh, Vice Chair, do you have any questions with this item? Thank you both for the written report and the verbal update. I don't have any questions. Sure. And I'll go ahead and open up public hearing first. Anybody in public would like to speak on this? Item number 20. We do not have any speakers. Good. I'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, I do have a, a brief comment on a couple of recommendations. Um, on this item number 4.3 recommendations where the uh, administration came back with the partial agree, um, I, I, the, it's stated clearly that the employment services uh, nor OSH have any influence authority over the housing choice voucher program administered by the uh, housing authority. Um, and can administration describe the nature of these relationship between two agencies to help facilitate the family's access to these program? Uh, my apology, could you please repeat the question? Yeah, so I'm trying to ask to see if you could help uh, us understand the nature of the relationship between the two agencies, between the Employment Service Agency or OSH, to help facilitate these families' access to get these housing vouchers. Uh, okay, so in response to that, in terms of the finding, we did um, look at the existing relationship between Employment Services, DEBS and Employment Services, and the Office of Supportive Housing. There was sort of at the time of the audit, shortly before the audit, there had been some more work with between those two agencies and the housing authority, especially to provide access to housing choice vouchers through the housing authority. 
um, but it wasn't as formalized as the relationship between the Office of Supportive Housing and the Social Service Agency. I think the intent of this recommendation was really to kind of continue sort of the efforts to coordinate and better facilitate. I mean, as you may know, housing is a real crisis for this population, access to housing. And the intent was really to create sort of avenues um, to kind of further provide access and facilitate access of CalWORKs families to housing authority, housing choice vouchers. So it was something that really had been started already. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a particularly formal process, but there was communication and discussion between those three agencies. And the intent of the recommendation is to continue to promote that relationship. Exactly. I, I certainly agree that they need to work together better uh, because we certainly have heard issues of individuals trying to get these vouchers and there's been the some were fortunate enough to be able to get it, and some had, could not get it for a long time because of some of these barriers. So is this something you could bring back to us, say, in 60 days and let us know how the progress is with these relationships, if that's been worked out? Yes. Great. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll just agendize that, say, two months from, the, from now from the, at the different uh, FGOC meeting. I see the county execs' uh, lights on. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to, to add, you know, one of the... The challenges, I mean, we have good, I think, partnerships and working relationships between, for example, Office of Supportive Housing and the Housing Authority. Housing Authority controls the actual vouchers. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those examples of how sometimes these, you know, these systems of care are fragmented between different types of, you know, different agencies that have different uh, governance uh, um, and uh, independence. And so that's just always something that I think we should be mindful of, um, and there's always opportunities to try to improve those uh, those uh, partnerships. But you know, the housing authority is, uh, as Cheryl well knows, the housing authority is a county-related entity, but it does function independently. Um, and so that's just something that I wanted to make sure the committee was aware. Yeah, and the thing is. Assuming it's working well, that's one thing, right? But if it's not working well and there's these barriers that you identified or potentially is happening, uh, I would like to hear about them in the next re uh, coming reports to see how we could uh, break down these barriers to housing. Yeah. We'll follow up. Great, thank you. And then the other items, item number recommendation 5.1, uh, being also the vice chair of the Health and Hospital Committee, I certainly agree with the recommendation. I would like to request the administration to reach out to our chair, Samidian, and this office about doing an agendizing the um, quarterly report at the HXC based on recommendation 5.1. Uh, I'm glad to see that uh, the administration agrees with the overwhelming majority of recommendations from the Management Audit Division. That's obviously a very good thing. I would like to monitor progress and implementation uh, as we move forward. And I would also like to request the administration come back to FGOC uh, with a fixed month progress update at the next year's March FGOC meeting on the rest of the recommendations from the Management Audit Division. And uh, do you have any further comment, uh, questions, colleagues? I don't, thank okay. you. And may I, would you like to make a motion to receive the report? Uh, move approval of uh, receiving the report. Okay, great. And uh, I'll second, uh, along with all the uh, comments and recommendations being uh, put forth, and let's go take a vote. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg? Yes. And Chairperson Lee? Yes, as well, thank you. Could I, I'm sorry, could I, through the chair, could I clarify? Yes. Are, is the report back in six months from us or from the administration? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think this, uh, uh, James, this is one where you're working with, uh, uh, with them. So would this be something from you or should it be coming back jointly? I, mean, I think we could do it either way, but I think you have a normal process of follow up, but the departments, I think, report back. Initially. Usually the department yeah. reports back. Yeah, I think it's the department okay. that reports back. All right, back so we could just make it clear. So the department, the department reports back in six months, uh, except for that specific item, I want to come back in 60 days. Uh, as I stated earlier, I appreciate it. All right. Thank Clarice you. Mudd, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, that was 20, I believe, item 21 is next. Go ahead, Cheryl. Good afternoon, Good Chair afternoon. Lee, Supervisor yes. Ellenberg. I'm Dan Goncher. I was the project manager for the management audit of the Office of the District Attorney's Consumer Protection Unit. Our audit was completed in August, and the purpose was to examine the operations, management practices, and finances 
of the Consumer Protection Unit to identify opportunities to increase the efficiency, effectiveness, and economy of the unit. The report includes three findings and nine recommendations. The department agrees with seven of the nine recommendations, partially disagrees with one recommendation, and disagrees with one recommendation. Um, so, I, sorry, I did have slides, but um, I'm on slide three now, if the clerk can pull that up. Thank you. Um, so, just a brief overview of our findings. We had three sections. Section one of our report focused on the unit's tracking of performance and workload. Our review of these areas found that the district attorney's office does not formally track performance metrics for the consumer protection unit, and that the unit does not consistently use the internal case management system, known as cyber law, to track civil consumer complaints as they develop into investigations or cases. According to unit management, cyber law was designed to handle criminal case types and is not well suited for consumer protection civil cases. For this reason, the unit tracks civil cases using file folders on their share drive. The unit also requires attorneys to maintain their own active case lists and provide that information to the supervising deputy district attorney on a monthly basis. We found that though the case list may be a useful tool for the attorneys and the managers, the lack of uniform data within cyber law limits the office's ability to track and report office-wide performance metrics. We recommend that the unit develop performance metrics for the consumer protection unit, which, help, which will help track the unit's efficiency, efficacy, and capacity, as well as its fairness and justice, handling consumer complaints, investigations, and prosecution. Additionally, we recommend that the unit develop reports in cyber law to monitor accuracy of case data, such as staff and team assignments, the open and closed status of cases, closure reasons, and the file locations when applicable for all complaints, investigations, and cases. Section two of our report, on if, the, if you could switch to the next slide, uh, thank you. Section two of our report uh, focused on the Consumer Protection Unit's outreach to the public. A review of this area found that although mediation services conducted 64 public outreach presentations in the three years between fiscal year 2017-18 and fiscal year 2019-20, mediation services conducted no outreach events in the following two years. Mediation services had their most recent outreach event on September 23rd, 2022, which was the first such event since March of 2020. While district attorney staff have stated that the decrease in outreach events was due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we noted that the department did not innovate or to provide online presentations or otherwise alter the outreach program due to the public health emergency. We also found that the Consumer Protection Unit does not reach out to communities or work with community partners or other county departments meeting with the public to increase outreach. Rather, the unit responds to members of the community who reach out to the department for education on services and scams, which means that there could be missed opportunities to further educate the public regarding consumer fraud and scams. Finally, we found that the outreach presentation itself does not specify the types of complaints the unit takes and does not explain the role of the enforcement side of the unit. We recommend that the Consumer Protection Unit partner with community groups and, and county departments to conduct proactive outreach to the public. Additionally, we recommend that the unit improve the outreach presentation to include consumer complaint examples and examples of what can be reported as a criminal offense to enforcement staff. Finally, we recommended that the unit include outreach and mediation procedures in the department's policies and procedure manual. And finally, section three of our report focused on the unit's provision of mediation services. Our review of this area found that the district attorney's policy manual does not outline the hiring process for the consumer protection mediator. The unit mediator position had, had been vacant from October of 2021 to March of 2023, or about 17 months. Management stated that they did not quickly fill the position due to a reorganization of the unit and a reduction of work during the pandemic. We found that the vacant mediator position had reduced the coordinator's capacity to focus on outreach, reducing opportunities for the public to be more aware of services provided by the unit and potential cons consumer scams. Like the Consumer Protection Unit, the Office of Mediation and Ombuds Services mediates public complaints covering many legal topics, including consumer complaints and landlord-tenant disputes. However, the unit does not have a formal system for coordination in place to refer applicable complaints to other departments that provide mediation services. 
we recommend that the unit update the policy manual to include the steps for the hiring of process for consumer mediators. We also recommend that the consumer protection unit work to identify volunteers from the community to train to help with mediation or outreach tasks. Finally, we recommend that the unit work with county departments that provide mediation services to coordinate mediation service referrals to allow for a more streamlined provision of services for the public. And uh, with that, I conclude my presentation and I'm available for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, check to my colleague, do you have any questions on this one? No, thank you again for the, the very detailed report and presentation. Okay, thank you. And uh, do we have any public who would like to speak on this? We currently do not have any speakers. Great, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, so on the issue of item 2.1 um, regarding including outreach and mediation procedures in the district attorney's policy and procedure manual, uh, the response from the DA was partially agree. Uh, so they didn't think that was the appropriate place for, for that because of the fact that I guess it's not to, supposed to be exhaustive list of all the procedures in the office. Um, and that these information is being housed in individual teams that's made accessible to those who use them as part of the work. Um, could you confirm whether this would be included from DA's office uh, with the next report out? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, because um, um, it's, I just want to make sure that this, this uh, information is accessible to everybody, uh, and I'm trying to seek some clarity that's captured and accessible to everybody, the staff, right? Correct. Um, and on item 3.1 regarding the update of the policy manual to include steps for hiring the process for consumer mediators, um, there's also a bit of a disagreement uh, on the current process to conducting these annual hiring process, process attorneys in order to follow the, like the bar exam and the staffing efforts uh, that's needed to do for the hiring. Um, the question I have is, do these mediator or consumer mediator, do they really need to be an attorney and have a law degree? Or is this just some, uh, is this something that they require? Is this just something that's nice to have? It is not required for the mediators to be attorneys. Okay, because I certainly don't want to use the bar exam as a reason to delay the hiring, um, especially given how much uh, volume of work that needs to be uh, dealt with. Uh, especially returning back to the pre-pandemic levels. So I certainly agree um, with the position. Language is not needed in that policy otherwise. Okay. And that's all I have for now on those two items. Um, and may I entertain a motion? Motion to, uh, to receive the report. And I'll go ahead and second that. Let's take a vote. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg? Yes. And Chairperson Lee? Yes as well. Thank you. All right, so now we're back to our regular agenda. One second here. So we're moving to item number four. Four, yes. Item number four is received report from probation department relating to implementation of the management audit recommendations regarding the William F. James Ranch. And I believe to uh, who is here to present today. Go ahead. Good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Lee and Vice Chairperson Ellenberg and members of the committee. My name is Alex Villa. I'm the Deputy Chief Probation Officer over Institutions for the Probation Department. And with me today, I have Mariel Caballero, Deputy, Deputy, <laughs> Deputy Director of Personal, uh, pers Probation Administration, excuse me, and Probation uh, Division Manager, Mark Utzi. Great. We do have a short, brief um, presentation, which is up for you, but I was um, uh, wondering if you would uh, be interested in entertaining uh, questions at this time, or would you like to proceed with the presentation? Uh, I think if it's brief, let's go and do sure. a couple minutes for the audience. Thank you. So just as a brief reminder, um, we're... Um, reporting out on the management audit of the William F. James Ranch, and we were last before this committee um, in March of this year. And um, what we wanted to highlight on the couple slides that we have is just the um, work that we've completed, what's in progress, and what's coming up next for uh, the probation department as we um, fulfill the um, recommendations contained within the um, audit report. So for the ranch and the milestones that we've accomplished thus far, we've um, 
we've implemented the core youth um, um, and, uh, core youth uh, program within the ranch. We pilot tested it. We uh, developed and uh, developed a scheduling uh, process. We um, have adopted and implemented the PBIS, which is the Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports approach. We're um, developing and finalizing our PBIS documentation, our handbook, if you will. And then, um, and with that being said, what we have in progress is that we continue to develop our evaluation process, um, looking at different aspects of the work, including recidivism. Um, we continue the um, observations and coachings related to um, the CBI, CY, the core youth uh, curriculum, and um, in ensuring the fidelity to the uh, model. Uh, we continue um, coordinating the training and working off the timeline that we have that's um, we're in progress. And then um, updating our, we have a PBIS database that um, is in place right now, but we continue to update that as we move forward. There's gonna be some training related to that for the staff as well that's next uh, coming up next. So we've made a, quite a bit of progress in a very brief period of time, which we're very excited about. Um, we continue to develop you know, our policies, procedures, and practices as it relates to all this work and the continued improvement as it relates to um, what we learn along the way. And so we're very excited about that as we move forward. Um, next slide. And then this, re this relates to section five um, for the agreements um, not monitored for effective implementation. And what we've uh, completed thus far are the group observation tools um, related to evidence-based programs. We've um, developed the instructions and training for the tools, and we've um, implemented a schedule and work plan for deployment of the tool. Um, we have two rounds of observations um, in already, which is exciting. Um, and we continue to um, document those processes as we move forward, which will drive our policy development and um, evaluation of, of the observations and refinement of the tools will come. Um, a few more iterations or a few more cycles of the um, implementing the tools and the observations will help us develop the policies and practices moving forward. We continue to meet on a regular basis and we continue to um, loop back with our partners as it relates to the adjustments necessary um, for this item. I think that's all we have for, by way of updates on, the, on our presentation. Um, we're op open for questions. Thank you. Vice Chair, no, no questions? Okay, I'm going to open the public hearing. Anybody in public would like to speak? We currently do not have any speakers. Aha, uh -huh. it's a quiet day today. Good. Um, well, I'll go ahead and close the, the public hearing. Um, the only questions I have is this. Uh, at the June FGOC meeting, um, I've expressed some concerns about staff working these really long 16-hour shifts, and I just want to see if there's any way we can make some progress uh, on this issue and also with labor relations. So the 16-hour shifts question, um, I believe, was posted previ uh, posed pre previously. And um, in order to formally address the 16-hour shift item, we um, are waiting until November when we can officially begin uh, formal conversations related to that. Um, but it is a point of um, information that on any given day, in any one pod, we only have on average one person who's working a 16 hour shift. So the vast majority of the staff are working an eight hour shift. They may work a 16 hour shift later in the week or later in their um, schedule. But on any given day, for most pods, we only have one staff really working a 16-hour shift. We try to minimize that to the degree possible. Well, having work in shift hours in the military, um, there are times I stand these 12-hour shifts, for example. And I tell you, 12 hours doesn't mean 12 hours because it also means the time to get to work and the time to leave. So when you talk about 16-hour shift, these folks have been working literally from the time they get out of their house, assuming an hour commute each way. We're talking about potentially 19 hours plus. Uh, it's not healthy. It's dangerous when they're on the road driving. I don't want somebody I know on the streets that has been walking 16 hours on the same road as me because bad things happen, as we all know. So I'm, I'm just really, really concerned about this issue. Uh, and and, and 
I understand the labor relations issue, but if there's any way we could engage that discussion before November so that we actually can find some solutions to fill. Is it a staffing issue? Like, it's just not enough people to do the work. That's why we're having these 16-hour the shifts of people pulling overtime. Uh, what is the, the real issue here? Uh, to formally modify the schedules and the associated um, rela cl classifications related to it, we have to have it those formal conversations and we won't be able to formally do that until november okay yeah i just want to let you know, the labor relations and any of the groups that's working on this that i just don't think that is truly healthy and it's something that we really should avoid um and uh, before bad things happens okay and uh, for now i think otherwise i think the rest of the report's been been good um and then the last thing i did want to mention is i've been really trying to get um our population of female girls uh, to be out of the system as much as possible. Um, the numbers we have generally are very small. We're talking about onesies, twosies, usually no more than three or four at, at any given time. And we've been talking about proposals of having separate locations instead of the ranch or uh, to, to house them. Now, there's an answer coming back is that under the SB 823 uh, realignment, uh, they have to be detained upon arrest until they actually get to see the judge or magistrate for the first appearance. So my question, I guess, is how much time is that usually? Is it 24, 48 hours, or is it even longer? Um, at the most, it's 48 hours. Is that by law? That, yes. that's Right, so they yes. would see a judge, but th at least they would, that very likely they would stay one or two nights before sure. a judge is being seen. So I'm, I'm so hope hopeful that we could minimize that period if, if possible uh, and just let us know how we could do to help. Um, all right, and that's all I have. Um, do I have a motion to approve? Move approval. And I'll go ahead and second it. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg? Yes. And Chairperson Lee? Yes, as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right, then moving on to item number five. Item number five is a report from the Office of Sustainability relating to key successes and progress relating sustainability and climate action programs for the period from January 23 to June 23, this past six months. And to present this, I believe, is Jasneet Sharma, our Director of the Office of Sustainability. A mouthful in your team. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, Supervisor Lee, yes, and yes, uh, good afternoon, Supervisor Ellenberg. Uh, again, I'm Jusneet Sharma, Director for the Office of Sustainability, and with me is uh, Gillian Corral. She's the Sustainability Manager with our office. Um, Supervisor, I don't have a formal presentation. If it's helpful, I can highlight some key achievements from the media report, or we're happy to just make ourselves available to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, I think, um, yeah. Vice Chair, what do you think? You okay? I, I am happy to defer to your preference. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, I think I just do have a few comments and questions. We could just go dive into it. Um, so uh, first of all, it, uh, thank you very much for this report. Uh, it's certainly wonderful to hear of the great sustainability and ca climate work that our office uh, are conducting to and how the other county departments have also been completing as well. Um, back in 2021, as you recall, I introduced a referral to create the Sustainability Commission. Mm -hmm. So I'm certainly very excited for the launch of this commission this fall once the remaining appointments are made. I do believe some of my colleagues have not made those appointments yet. So whatever you need to do to remind them to make those appointments, uh, please, please remind them again. And I'm also lo looking forward to the Regional Priority Climate Action Plan, the PCAP, and also the Comprehensive Climate Action Plan that will be created as part of the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. Now, when they are completed, I'm sure these are the items that can also be reviewed by our new and soon to be launched Sustainability Commission for their input as well. Um, and then the third item I want to mention is this thing called the Youth mm -hmm. Climate uh, Initiative. Mm -hmm. um, so what role do you see the Sustainability Commission will be able to play uh, in that process? Absolutely, and I'll actually look, uh, look to Gillian to answer that question sure. for you. please. Good afternoon. Yes, uh, we're really much, very much looking forward to the launch of this commission. And as you know, Supervisor Lee, we have two youth seats reserved on this 11-member commission, so youth okay. ages 14 to yep. 22. 
And you know that was purposeful to make sure that the youth have a are in a leadership position with uh, with this commission. Uh, we are keeping it open as as to the relationship between the commission and the youth climate initiative and. Uh, we really would like these two new youth leaders, these two youth commissioners to, you know, give us some feedback and have their ideas uh, elevated as to how that relationship might look. Uh, so leaving that open and, and having that conversation as the commission's established. Right. We're trying to give them as much um, flexibility moving forward since it's so new, right? And, and also, do you have any... Um, uh, idea in terms of uh, the timeline on the work plan because I know that you've been meeting with a group of community mem members uh, and that the work plan uh, is uh, under development and but it also of course needs to I believe is it has to be approved by the state as well yeah, and this is for the youth climate initiative Correct. Just to yes absolutely so we still have to establish an agreement with the California Natural Resource Agency first. That's the state agency that's the that's administering this grant. Um, and once that agreement is established, we also then have to submit a work plan to them. Uh, they have been really cooperative with us throughout the process. I have to give them full credit there. And we've already started working with community partners to develop that work plan, which we'll be submitting to them pretty soon. Uh, so things are moving simultaneously, both right. the agreement and the work plan process. Right. So it's really a uh, CNRA, the California Natural Resources um, Group, that is a state requirement that the work really uh, needs to have that work plan finish. Do they have to approve it first before we Absolutely. do it? So, Absolutely. So they actually have to review it, approve it before we could actually do the work? Absolutely, because the work plan is going to clearly call out what the tasks are, as any work plan should, and then what's the budget that will be used for each task, and if potentially that funding is going to additional organizations, we have to clearly indicate all of that aspect in the work plan, and then, you know, procurement processes to secure organizations to do that body of work. So right. yes, they have to approve it first. Right. So at that point, do you see that, is it going to be like an RFP process after the work plan is developed to get out to the community groups for uh, biddings? We're talking with our procurement team as, as well, uh, supervisor. We completely understand the urgency to move fast on this. And right. we're also you know, looking for guidance from the state agency if they mm -hmm. have additional requirements for us to meet. But I think I'd, I'd like to assure you that we are trying our best to move as fast as possible, but keeping our county contracting processes in mind as well. Great, thank you. Yes, the uh, working with the state's uh, contracting requirements is never easy, but we certainly want to do whatever we can. So please let us Absolutely. know in our office if necessary. We certainly have good contacts with my predecessor, who is now a state senator, yes. uh, up there. So we could probably make things move a little quicker if, if needs be. So please let us know if CNR is giving you guys hassle. We do. Uh, and also uh, know that we have groups that have been doing this work and they want to certainly continue doing the work, uh, but certainly funding has been an issue. Uh, and since this focus is on youth, uh, what do you think we could do to expedite RFP, a single source, or, or, or maybe is a single source process something that's made available in the future? Is that possible? Like I said, Supervisor, we're going to be looking at all of those options and we'll be working with our contracts and grants team to identify what's the best uh, process to move fast on this as well. Uh, single source can always be explored if they're the only organization you know, that's best situated to do that work in the county. Mm -hmm. We, in our initial, uh, what we call landscape mapping of organizations, mm -hmm. we have come up with a lot of organizations that are doing some body of work and mm -hmm. that was the goal of this approach that we've taken is to bring all the community partners together that mm -hmm. are already working in this area. Right, exactly. Um, now, uh, relate to sustainability, as we all know, um, COP27 took place last year. I don't believe our county is very active on it. And I just understood that COP28 is coming up at the end of November, early December in Dubai. Do you, is there any plans for our county to have any involvement in this, uh, in this conference? Nothing that we've discussed at this time, Supervisor. Okay, all right. Maybe we can have a separate discussion on that. I think it's important that uh, we get folks involved and, and certainly it's one of those occasions that could be useful, not just for our staff, but I think many of the youth uh, mm -hmm. group as well. Um, all right, so that's all I have. Thank you very much, Ms. Right. Thank you. Did I open the public hearing on this yet? We currently do not have any speakers. Okay, so I'll go and close the public hearing. Um, Vice Chair, do you have a motion to receive the report? Um, Motion to receive the report. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. And I'll go and second it. All right, let's take a vote. Thank you. Vice Chairperson Mellenberg? Yes. And Chairperson Lee? Yes, as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, I believe item number six was added to consent. Mm -hmm. You're on item number nine. And seven. So now seven, eight, right. So now we are jumping to item number nine, uh, a report from the Facilities and Fleet Department and the Behavior Health Services Department relating to behavior health facility expansion efforts and progress. And I believe we have our Facilities and Fleet Director, Jeff Draper, and Key Lee, our Deputy County Executive. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Keeley, Deputy County Executive here with uh, Jeff Draper and also Eric Rier from Behavioral Health Services Department here uh, as well to answer any questions you might have. Um, just a couple of highlights for today's report. Um, the report includes an attachment, a, a chart listing out the uh, beds that we've added by category since um, July 1st, 2022, and also the projects that are underway. Um, this is the second iteration of a table or chart. Uh, happy to receive feedback. We'll continue to iterate on, on uh, that document and the, the layout. Um, so the second um, highlight is um, for the county facilities. Currently, we are focused on uh, the possible conversion of 101 Jose Figueres, into, uh, converting that into a mental health rehabilitation center. Um, a, facility, a feasibility study will be completed by February of 2024. If it is feasible, uh, we would have to look at um, alternative locations for the existing programs, uh, but we're still a few months away from you know, considering those options. With that, uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Keith. Um, Vice Chair, do you have any questions for now? I do on this one. Thank go ahead, you. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Key, and thank you, Jeff, uh, for being here. And yes, the format of the, the document, I think, is significantly improved. And as I do with everything, I look forward to continued iteration and fine tuning. But thank you very much. Um, and uh, my team will also check in offline on some of the projects. But at a high level, um, I'd like to suggest, uh, number one, that we look at how to clarify contracted beds versus new construction or renovation projects. Uh, second, that we add a column on the source of funds being utilized for, for any capital expenditures, grant, bond. Um, I want to leave it at grant, bond. I realize there could be general funds. Um, and three, uh, that we make sure to distinguish between beds that are truly additive to our system of care versus those that are replacing other beds. And for example, the I, I would look at the 77 beds at the new acute facility that's in process um, on the Valley Health Campus. It adds, of those 77 beds, 29 are actually additive. The rest are replacements of the 48 at BAP um, that will be decommissioned, demobilized not used any longer. Um, let me also address, please, the, um, the, 100, uh, the 101 uh, Jose Figueros, um, the planning for, for acute beds. And I appreciate that the um, sense right now is from the feasibility study that that's the best option for subacute uh, facilities. How are we, it, it's something, it's, it's a start for sure, but how do you envision that we are going to really be able to scale up to meet the need um, and not just convert one facility to, to another when we really need so much at virtually every, every level of care? Um, thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg, for the question. Um, the conversion of 101 Jose Figueres, um, we believe, would be additive, although a relatively small number of subacute beds. Uh, be, it would be additive because we would move the existing operations to another facility, uh, which would, um, <clears throat> so that would be a replacement, uh, not additive. Right. Um, and, and then, uh, second, uh, we understand that there is still a significant need for subacute. We're still looking at other uh, county properties. Um, and um, in addition to exploring those, once we've uh, explored those fully, then we can look at potentially um, sort of non-county-owned uh, sites as well. 
and both for subacute and um, uh, relocating crisis residential beds that are currently operated by Momentum and the Crisis Stabilization Unit. Th th those are the beds that are being moved out of Jose Figuera? If, if, we, if we and the board agree that we should convert 101 Jose Figuera, so we would have to relocate the two Momentum programs, which are a Crisis Stabilization Unit and a Crisis Residential Program. And just kind of help me understand how that is advantageous as opposed to creating something new for for the subacute it we're, we're we're taking out programs putting in another program we have to find some place for these programs are those going to be new facilities are uh, those yeah for um the um for where we would move the momentum programs we mm -hmm. believe we have options for leasing facilities or, um, well, leasing facilities. Uh, we're pursuing uh, one right now. And um, the reason why we've focused on Jose Figueres for now is mm -hmm. because we believe that it will be uh, more cost effective to renovate our, that facility than, than to build one from the ground up. Although we would have to, we're still doing those assessments on the other county properties. Right, and the, thank you, and, and the, the places that we would move the other to, would I be right in thinking that those are easier to move because they're not at as high um, kind of a hospital standard? Uh, uh, that's correct. Um, the primary reason why we're using Jose, 101 Jose Figueres be, is because of its fire rating. Um, if I make a mistake, uh, Jeff will correct me. It's fire sure rating. Will. <laughs> and it, it, um, that fire rating is, is adequate to allow for a subacute facility. The current programs there can be moved to um, uh, other facilities that are not, do not have a high, as a high <laughs> fire rating. And yet they are still perfectly safe and yes. there's no fire risk. Yes. Um, there, I, I, I think that's an important piece. And does Oshpod come into play? Is this a high enough level that it's a hospital facility? No, I see Jeff no, shaking his head now. This is licensed by DHCS, uh, Department of Healthcare Services. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, the, Jose Figuera would add 31 to 45 beds um, if that plan proceeds. The grid shows another 29 subacute beds in development. Um, will we also, I, I assume, or shouldn't assume, you, I hope you're not stopping here and that we're proceeding with consideration of other sites on the list for 15, um, on that list of 15 for additional subacute projects to close the gap? Um, w uh, correct, uh, we are not stopping here. We're continuing to assess uh, the other properties um, uh, we believe that we'll have the final assessment in January after we have um, discussions internally and we can make some recommendations for the, for the FGOC and the, for, for the board. Great, thank you very much for, for spelling out a little bit of this. I appreciate it and I'm happy to move uh, receipt of the, this report as well. Actually, I'll second it and actually do have a friendly amendment on the, uh, these numbers. Um, so first of all, I want to thank the uh, administration for producing this attachment aid, the status of behavior health treatment facility and temporary shelter expansion um, table. That's very helpful to, to lay out mm -hmm. all those number of beds, which is great. Um, I'm a very visual person. I like charts and, and flow charts. Uh, and since there are these movements of beds that we're closing, we're moving and what we're proposing, uh, Key, is it possible for you to kind of put out a chart of these different movements so we can see which is moving where? And I think it would be a lot easier to see it. That's what I'm thinking. I, I very much like that. And, and in fact, I think I didn't clearly include in my motion the suggestions um, th that I made for, for our next iteration of the chart, which would include clarification between contracted beds and um, construction or renovation, a column on the funding source, um, distinguishing between adding or, or replacing, and, and I would add this um, 
as well when some when a service is moved from one site to exactly. another to have an indication of that. Right. I love a good chart too. Okay, thank you. So if, you, if that could be done, um, it could be cartoonish, it doesn't matter. Uh, I just want to be clear so that people could see where things are going and make it look like, not like we're closing anything when we're actually having it relocated somewhere else and having these locations being put in, I think would be very, very helpful. That's actually a really good point that I hadn't um, thought about that we do want to make sure that we're not panicking anybody that moving an operation means losing those those beds. I think that really is critical. So thank you for that addition, Supervisor Lee. Right, good, thank you. So um, just, I think I'm just reiterating these things, right? We're talking about the expansion uh, of subacute at three facilities, uh, 401 North Ridge Vista for 11 Murphy Conservatorship beds. We are talking about VHC Morgan Hill for 18 beds with behavior and health needs. And then 101 uh, Jose Figueres has mentioned 31 to 45 beds. Um, if the feasibility study comes back you know, with some you know, promising results, right? Yeah, so all, all those there. And then of course the guarantee facility expansion providing a 29 beds there. Um, so I mean, I, I'm seeing a lot of these numbers, which is exciting, but yeah, if we could put it all on diagrams and all that, that would be very helpful. Uh, and I, I just want to say, you know, given the need of subacute beds uh, need in our county that was shown in the RAND report that we also uh, focused on previously. Uh, really appreciate our uh, administration's efforts for making this a priority uh, at this level of care specifically. So I say thank you. All right, uh, that being said, I'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. We currently do not have any speakers. All right, good. I'll go ahead and close the public hearing. and. Uh, and we have a motion. I believe I've seconded it. And let's go take a vote. Great. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg? Yes. Chairperson Lee? Yes, as well. Thank you. Today we're moving along really quickly. I think we got 10 and 11 moved to consent. So I think now we're moving to item number 12, which is recommendations relating to the updates to the 10 year capital improvement program and associated board policies. I believe we have uh, County Budget Director Greg Couture and Jeff Draper. You're still here. Good. <laughs> Good afternoon. Go ahead. And I think I'll just kick off this item with a couple brief comments. Um, yes, go ahead, <clears throat> James. What, uh, what's included in the packet is a um, brief ledge file along with some pr proposed edits to some of the board policies. But what I really wanted to describe, and I think it's laid out, um, in some of the slides that were attached as well as the, our kind of reconceptualization of the 10-year CIP process, which I think right now is just honestly not a very useful document for any meaningful purposes. Um, and what uh, we've been talking about internally is reconceptualizing it a little bit to break it into kind of portfolios that focus on specific areas of the county's capital work um, that would allow FGOC the opportunity to really weigh in on those and the board uh, to do it kind of in an, uh, take on the focus of kind of one piece of the portfolio each year to identify funding sources, including, for example, and I think this is just a reality that we need to start talking about, but it'll obviously be an ongoing conversation, the reality that for some of these types of projects, we need to be thinking about a geo bond or some other funding sources if we actually want to see these happen. And then taking out of the process some of the more maintenance type things that have really cluttered up the CIP historically, and you'll see a lot of the edits proposed in the policy are kind of geared toward that. In particular, we've attached as an example um, a document from the city and county of San Francisco, which actually kind of it looks a little bit more that way. It's much more user friendly for the public. It identifies funding sources. It talks about, you know, it's focused on new projects and, and facilities as opposed to some of the maintenance stuff. Um, and, uh, and so that's kind of a conception of where we're headed. It will be a multi year effort. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is uh, we're going to be implementing a new budget system. Uh, and second, the OBA staff um, do have to focus uh, foremost on the task of dealing with the current budget, which uh, as the committee is aware and as we'll be discussing with the board next month in more detail, uh, is facing a significant structural deficit that's going to require significant staff attention. So we're happy to answer questions, but I wanted to lay it out that way. I don't know that the ledge file did 
the best job of explaining some of those pieces. Uh, so wanted to make sure that that was kind of laid out there. Um, and I know that Jeff, Greg, and I are happy to answer questions. Great. Thank you, James. Um, Greg, anything else to add? Uh, no, uh, through the chair, I think the uh, accounting executive covered it. Um, maybe just add one little thing. You know, there was a lot of input from uh, board members uh, uh, last spring through the budget process about having a more engaging, accessible information. We have been studying a lot of other urban uh, counties to see how they do that. And we do realize there's room to grow and modernize, and we are you know, working towards that end. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I do remember back in the May FGOC meeting, um, actually Supervisor Ellenberg that requested us to uh, look at also, I think, County of San Diego's capital planning project processes uh, as, as a potential uh, sample of that structure of making it more public facing and something more easy to digest for, for the public regarding ongoing capital improvements and all that, right? So and that's in the response to that, you look at the one in San Francisco as well. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Vice Chair. Thank you. Uh, James, thank you for, for setting that up and um, Greg and, and Jeff for, for today's report and, and for continuing to, to iterate uh, with us capital planning. I <laughs> learn more and more is just an immense task. Um, I definitely um, appreciate the iteration in terms of how we're presenting material. I'm also really interested in iterating the substantive process of prioritization. I d definitely agree with the general recommendations about how to proceed, what information we should include. James, I very much like the portfolio uh, approach, so we have a, a clear chunk to look at each year, um, which absolutely needs to include um, proposed or potential funding sources. Um, it certainly makes sense to separate maintenance from any of the, of the new work. Um, what I want to share is sort of my perspective and some thoughts about how we might be able to increase visibility to the board and the public, not only on the, on the, the pretty list, but really what the planning process is, and to make sure that board policy is informing the prioritization uh, process. In, in my view, FAF, in your expertise, should be operationalizing the projects, providing information about feasibility, funding, certainly urgency from a safety or, or usage perspective. But the board really needs to be more involved in directing which projects are prioritized um, and we clearly need to understand what funds are available or accessible for different um, projects. Kind of the TLDR for that is just that our capital investments have to reflect our strategic priorities um, as a county as defined by the board. And I think that the, the guidance that we can offer monthly in this committee can further that, should certainly align with established Board of Supervisors priorities. Um, but this to me is really, um, in my view, and I know every supervisor thinks differently, kind of the, the core of the FGOC work. This is the biggest pot of, of money. Um, and we really have the opportunity to be very transparent, very collaborative, and very uh, responsible. Um, I would propose that, that this, this chart sort of further iterate into um, a dashboard with some, standard, with some standard metrics. I would like to see us have an expanded version of the lists of projects um, that are already included, but that also includes projects that aren't currently recommended by staff. Um, I know that there's more on the list and that you pull out a, a subset, but the board and the public should still see everything that's on the list, even to say, no, we're not doing this stuff right now. Um, uh, certainly, you've got the one-time cost to build, which is helpful. Again, we also need potential funding sources, debt service, if that would be applicable, estimated annual operating costs, staffing requirements, really a full robust um, picture. And I know that a lot of this exists 
in the current document, if you, if you read each of the paragraphs, different projects have different amounts of um, information, but it, it's not really easily accessible or comparable uh, across projects. And I, I think James's point about the creating the buckets um, will help, but there should be some uniformity, even if that uniformity has in some columns, information's not available for this piece, that's okay. Um, it still shows us that we are looking at the same metrics uh, for every project. Uh, and then regarding the attached board policy, it was notable to me, I still feel a little bit new on this, this committee, um, FGOC is charged with using explicit criteria to evaluate the administration's recommendations. In fact, I think this is the, the committee with the, mm -hmm. the clearest mandate um, and series of, of responsibilities. And again, in my view, I think that this really critical task um, is, is worth, if not the bulk, then a good chunk of our, of our attention um, every month. This is also a place where we may need to discuss the interplay between the 10-year capital improvement plan, the fiscal budget that we pass each year, and then certainly any new board-initiated capital projects that may or may not take precedence over work that's, that's already in the pipeline. So I'd like to ask uh, administration to return next month um, with an iterated, more detailed plan that includes these metrics. This is what I'll, I'll, I'll use to shape my motion. And again, that includes both currently recommended projects and any other capital plans. Um, proposed by either administration or the Board of Supervisors that exist but don't have funding identified and aren't on this current list of recommended projects and, and the couple of examples that, that, that came to mind because we've so recently talked about them are the, the ag housing brought forward by D1, the West Valley uh, Clinic brought forward by D5. There may be others, um, including from my district, but that was sort of where I was where I was going um, with this because it feels to me that when we are making decisions with huge financial implications, we are still doing so too often in very discreet ways without having an overall sense of strategy, funding availability, what gets knocked off to, to bump some, something else up. And I think that the board the administration and the public would all benefit from that. So, I agree with those comments. If I could just add some thoughts, um, the um, I, I think there's a there's a several challenges with kind of the current process. Um, mm -hmm. One of them being um, that things are kind of lumped together, and so the idea of looking at portfolios in part is also looking at them in in a way that's based on the staffing portfolio that's associated with projects, so you can look at that capacity, as well as the funding streams, which mm -hmm. look different in different areas uh, of the county. And so it doesn't make sense to prioritize across those portfolios, but it does make sense to prioritize within, within them. each one. Exactly. Yeah. The, the second piece is, you know, we haven't had, um, the way we have historically fund, with the exception of the seismic bond for the hospital, which was many years ago now. We haven't um, sought any uh, um, non, uh, any, any, any other funding sources basically for our capital work. We've paid for it through either pay-as-you-go um, funding or uh, lease revenue bonds that we issue, which is the debt services paid for by our operating budget. Um, and, uh, of course, that will continue to be an essential part of how we do capital work at the county. Um, but, uh, but because of that, we haven't really been having the conversations around how we do certain facilities or not. And there may be some opportunities that might come, depends on what happens, of course, but, you know, the legislature has put an amendment on the ballot, a constitutional amendment, that for certain types of our facilities, but not others, you know, may, if voters approve, lower, for example, the threshold for a geobond. Um, 
that then, I think, necessitates a different type of conversation, including a different thought process around what we do with what kinds of projects and how those are funded. So these are the kinds of things that just haven't been a part of the process so far. And as a result, exactly what you're talking about, which is uh, there'll be um, referrals or new initiatives for new things, but there, it, but, um, there isn't then an integration with kind of how they're funded and what that means for what else is kind of on the list. Um, so I especially like the idea of um, maybe a way to think about it is almost a, a standby list or essentially what are, what are other projects that you know, we would like to have because of course facility needs will probably always be greater than available funding. Um, but so that there's recognition, okay, there are these things out there and then there can be conversations not just around how do we prioritize within the available funding, but uh, what opportunities might exist to try to get those things able to be funded, whether it's uh, through bond options or in some cases, uh, state uh, grant funding streams or others. And, and that should absolutely be indicated in particular because um, first of all, if, if, if a geo bond at any point is part of our conversation, knowing what projects would be um, eligible would be an important uh, indicator. Exactly. I mean, there, there's so much that's in flux right now with the, the governor's mental health uh, housing bond that can be used now for both locked and unlocked facilities, the potential of a regional uh, housing bond uh, measure, which I certainly hope would, would include and anticipate would include um, uh, farm worker housing and, and you know the 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 board project the board led supervisor led projects that I'm calling out is is, is in no way um, critical of them it, it's it's making sure that we are inclusive and when we are talking about our funding and board priorities and leading everything with equity that we are prioritizing from a complete list yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense, and I agree that there are a lot of moving pieces. Um, the other thing I just wanted to comment on earlier but forgot to mention is you're absolutely right. This is actually one of the things that's explicitly called out as part of FGOC's responsibility and the rules of the board, uh, and I think we would welcome there being more conversation uh, in FGOC uh, through around this process. Um, you know, we should think about kind of what that cadence is and would ask to work collaboratively with the committee chair on thinking about how that aligns with the budget process and staff's ability to actually do the analysis to support that activity so that it's lined up appropriately with the timelines for the budget process. And for us, frankly, to have um, you know a real understanding of the board mandated role in this. I mean, we, we essentially, we created the policy for ourselves. It was in place before either Otto or I was on the, on the board, but, it, but I do think that there would be tremendous value in doing this with a level of rigor um, that maybe we, we haven't taken advantage of yet. Yeah, I do think it's been many years. Um, the one, the one co other comment, though, that I would make is um, just in recognition of kind of our broader fiscal uh, position is that for many, many years, the county was really only in a position to do uh, bare bones, what I would call bare bones maintenance, basically not even the full maintenance that it was necessary, but only emergency maintenance. And, um, you know, I think there were some lessons learned from that era of, of um, how costly it was ultimately for the organization to avoid and defer um, some of the broader set of maintenance. But just want to acknowledge that here because I think um, that's why I, I framed it in terms of the context of thinking about these different funding streams because um, the ability for the general fund to support the types of projects on the capital side that we have in the last several years is just not gonna be there going forward. Uh, maybe sometime way in the future, but but at least for the next several years. Uh, and that's just something that needs to be thought of as we're thinking about the process. Um, and, um, and 
you know, another reason why we need to we need to be, I think, much more clear about uh, prioritization and much more clear about funding sources and what funding sources might be dependent on future actions like uh, voter support for certain types of projects. Thank you, and certainly as the chair of the committee, sure. Supervisor Lee, I'm very interested in your take on all of this and whether it fits in with your vision of, of uh, structuring and leading this committee. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I am um, uh, fascinated about this discussion, actually, because I, I certainly do think that the long-term planning uh, is what is needed in these type of um, capital improvement uh, projects. Uh, first of all, I want to thank staff for the report and, and looking at the other uh, counties. Uh, many have known that uh, I'm not ashamed of uh, copying good ideas from our other brethren in other counties, and, and certainly this is exactly one of those areas that uh, I think some other ideas, whether it's LA County, whether it's San Diego, whether it's San Francisco, they might have better way of doing this uh, sunshine process, make it more transparent, more easy to read for the public is good. Um, the fact that you're getting rid of those so-called basic maintenance related projects from CIP is absolutely crucial because sometimes I, I'm, I'm very much a, a guy believe in less is more. Uh, when you have that much detail on the little stuff sometimes, people get lost uh, the forest uh, when you're stuck in the trees. So I'm glad that this is the way we're moving forward. I think it's really important uh, on these type of, we call large scale projects. Um, I truly agree with James that uh, when we are talking about capital improvement project, general fund is really not the place for it. General fund usually is used for things of ongoing basis. Uh, when it comes to CIP, I think we need to be honest with the public. You know, we do need to have the courage to do these GO, which is the general obligation bond. We should state it outright, right up front, uh, and and get the votes from this board to get. I believe you need what four, or f four or five votes as a super majority, Th three. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it really is something that needs to be brought up to us early on. When's the last time our county actually did a GO bond for any project at this point? Anybody can remember? Two thousand and eight. Right, so that's a lot about what, I was still a teenager then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no, but reality is, I mean, it, it's that many years. I mean, is it really true that we don't have any large project that needs to be done since 2008? I don't, I don't think that's the case. So I just want to make sure that if these are the issues that need to come up, I think we need to move these processes a little bit quicker to be sunshine. I mean, just my own uh, recollection for the votes that some of the big votes that we've taken previously last couple of, couple of years regarding the potential mental health facility we talked about potentially a uh, a, a, a replacement uh, incarceration facility from to, to get rid of our main jail all these are things that clearly is a capital improvement project that needs to go through this type of a process uh, so I think you know, just mentioning these couples I mean there's so many more other things earthquake retrofit uh, another one that we need to work on so there's so many of these projects that really need to be out there and I, I think we need to get these these uh, sunshine early on and then get it in front of the voters uh, and let them decide if this is something that the voters don't want to proceed. Uh, I think we we need to get that uh, get that yeah, a on a uh, the sooner the better because the longer we wait on these things, as we know, the cost of financing is much higher. I mean, let's face it: a year ago, interest rate is quite a bit lower. Where we are now, trying to get these bonds, the cost has already gone up just on the cost of the bond. Forget the the building part, right? So, I think timing is a lot of times important. And again, we don't know how much the the interest rate is going to go up, but I would say it is truly important to to uh, get these issues out front uh, fast and early. And we might try to do the timing when it's ready. Try to time it to get the best rate, of course. But um, so that, that yeah, go ahead, James. Yeah, I I totally agree on that. And one of the things that's you know. Good news, bad news on the capital side is we're, we're always talking about multi-year projects here, right? Yeah, of course. And so, you know, the the bad news, of course, is that it takes many years to get one of these facilities built. Um, but the good news is actually it kind of means in a way that, that the committee can really work with subsets of these things over a period of years, right? Because, um, you know, if we're packaging something, for example, to go to the voters at some point in the future, um, you know, that's gonna be a, at a certain interval, it's gonna be a package of things that's a multi-year long package. That's why kind of big picture conceptually you talk about things like a 10-year CIP, right? Because there's recognition it's not an annual project the way, um, you know, the way our operating budget is. 
Um, and so there's opportunity there. And I think there's good opportunity there. And we think about things like, you know, you mentioned the seismic issues. You know, we've, we talked earlier about the sustainability plan, you know, the, the climate change resiliency issues. Um, there's, you know, significant hospital access. We talked earlier on this agenda about behavioral health facilities, right? Those are just four gigantic sets of things right there. And, um, you know, I do think it's long past time that we really put together some of those things in a way that is accessible and that's clear about the needs and, and for our organization. Good. And so we're, I'm excited about it. Yes, thank you, James. Um, if no further questions, I'll open up the public hearings. If any public has any comments today, they've been very quiet today. We do not have any speakers. Okay, then we're going to close the public hearing. Vice Chair, any additional comments or you have a motion? Uh, no, I believe I did. Did I form my comments in the, did I make a motion? Not yet. I intended to. Let me just, <laughs> hang on. <laughs> uh, yes, so my motion was uh, to receive the report and to direct administration to return next month with a more detailed plan with the metrics described in my earlier comments and that includes both currently recommended projects and other capital project plans proposed by either administration or the Board of Supervisors that exist, but don't yet have funding identified and are not on the current list of recommended projects. I will second that, and actually on that report, if it is possible, if that's sufficient time, to identify which ones that we actually should go with a geo bond. So we are highlight which are the ones, and then if that's the case, the timeline of when that would be expected to be. James, or is that too soon? at least would be eligible. Be eligible. Yeah, eligible. Oh, I, just, I just want to clarify because now I'm realizing as I heard the motion a second time, as I understood it originally, you're at, you were asking us to come back with kind of this work plan and process, but then as I'm, under, as I'm hearing Supervisor Lee's comments, I'm hearing us to come back with actual list. Those are two different they things. They are two different things. So You talked about the work plan process and I am happy to have that. And if you want direction, I will add that to my memo. My motion uh, was a little bit simpler on just our, on iterating on the current chart that we're using to add more um, uh, to add more of those metrics. And I'm if any of that wasn't clear, I'm happy to resend it as well. It, it's no, I, th I think we can definitely we can definitely do that. But then I, I guess my question would then be, I think we can absolutely come back with that. Um, is the committee then comfortable with us moving the policy edits forward? I am. I think so. I think okay. Okay. Yes. Great. Okay. That th that's where I was. Uh, so that that I think is great. We'll move the policy edits to the full board. We'll come back with the list with those items mm -hmm. that we've been discussing, and we will go ahead and try to. And you'll uh, work with the chair on a on a work yes. plan for this. Perfect. That sounds great. Thank you. Still moved. Perfect. Clear as mud. Good job. <laughs> okay. That's the motion. So and the motion would be A and B for the Correct. recommended action. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. We have a motion and a second. Let's vote. Great. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg? Yes. And Chairperson Lee? Yes, as well. Good. Uh, 13 and 14 were held, and then 15th is uh, receiving report, verbal report from the Office of County Exec relating to state legislative activity. And I believe today we have our Deputy County Executive, uh, David Campos, to uh, assist us on this issue. Good afternoon, David. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Vice Chair, President Allenberg, uh, Deputy County Executive David Campos on behalf of the Office of the County Executive. Uh, we have, when we can, tried to do a written report, but as you know, we've had the last few days of the session, so a lot of moving pieces that did not allow us to do a written report, but I'm happy to provide this oral presentation, uh, beginning with uh, the overarching goal that we set out uh, which was to increase and enhance the engagement, the presence of the county in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. And I think that the numbers of what has been done in the last few months speak for themselves. Uh, we've had uh, the largest number of uh, bills on which we have taken positions uh, in the last few years, 79 bills, in fact. We also have sent out the largest number of letters uh, taking positions and opining on um, various bills, uh, about 255 letters as of last week. And we have sponsored or co-sponsored seven bills, which is the largest number of bills that we have put forward as a county. 
and I'm happy to report that all seven bills have passed the hey. legislature. <laughs> uh, three of those seven have been signed already by Governor Newsom, uh, SB 406 by uh, former Supervisor, current Senator uh, Dave Cortesi, which provides a CEQA exemption for local government uh, uh, provisions of the financial assistance uh, requirements, and this uh, expedites affordable housing units, which are badly needed. SB 462 by Senator Wahab, which aligns privacy restrictions within the law uh, around uh, public benefits. And then SB 462 by Senator Cortesi, uh, which gives uh, county council uh, uh, councils uh, hazardous waste uh, enforcement authority. We are awaiting signature on four bills, uh, and, and that includes SB 335, which is our sales tax uh, authorization bill. And you know we are cautiously optimistic that they will be either signed by the governor or let you know uh, become law. And uh, we are you know waiting and in the process, making sure that we're in consultation with the authors to make sure that we address any issue that may arise uh, with respect to the governor's office. So we will keep you posted on, on those bills. Uh, we also, as you know, worked extensively on uh, the issue of behavioral health and not only the reforms that have been put forward by Governor Newsom, but also the changes that were proposed by Senator Eggman uh, and SB 43. And, uh, we are also very grateful that President Allenberg and her staff were also very involved in that effort. And as you may be aware, uh, the two components of the governor's reforms, uh, SB 326, which was an Eggman bill, and AB 531, they were amended uh, along the lines of some of the things that we pushed for, uh, SB 326, was amended uh, to, among other things, expand and clarify the process for moving money uh, between the various funding categories. Uh, and that was critical because it gave counties like Santa Clara more flexibility, uh, even though perhaps not to the extent that we had uh, in hoping that, that they would give us. Uh, AB 531 uh, was amended to, un an to add an extra $1.5 billion uh, on top of the proposed $4.7 billion for housing and behavioral health facilities. And it was also amended to expand the scope of facilities that may be funded, uh, which is really important in terms of giving us the resources we need to address the need. Uh, you know, and to, together, these two bills will comprise Proposition 1, which will be on the March ballot this coming year. Uh, and those two bills are currently pending before Governor Newsom for his signature. And then SB 43 uh, by Senator Eggman was amended to give counties until 2026 uh, to implement the changes that were outlined in that bill. Uh, we obviously welcome that two-year delay, but unfortunately, the author uh, declined our you know, final request that would have moved us uh, from our perspective as a support position by making uh, substance use disorders co-occurring uh, with mental health disorders as we had requested. And the one thing that happened in that process, if I may say, is that there was uh, unity among the large counties on that specific piece. You had LA County, San Diego County, and Santa Clara County specifically asking the author uh, to make that change. And, and we worked very hard to do that outreach. And with respect to uh, budget items, uh, we uh, submitted four different requests through our delegation. Two of them, as you know, were approved. Uh, one by Senator Wahab, $500,000 uh, to fund annual fellowships at four uh, faith-based uh, reentry resource centers. And then uh, also won $2 million by Senator Cortesi uh, for a guaranteed basic income pilot program. Uh, and we're grateful for that. And you know, probably something that I think is going to be really critical and is already proving to be really significant is the fact that we work with President Allenberg with our county executive uh, to have the first ever Santa Clara County delegation meeting uh, in Sacramento. Uh, and we're grateful to President Allenberg and her staff for making that happen because it is quite significant. You, you had meetings that we held 
with each one of our 10 uh, members of our delegation. And I can tell you from talking to, to some of them that they were excited. It was the first time that that group was together in one room. Uh, and there is now uh, an expectation that this will be an ongoing thing. Uh, and uh, the next meeting is scheduled for December. And at the suggestion of the president and the county executive, the meeting will be taking place at VMC, uh, which is really timely. Actually, that was the suggestion of Assembly Member Kalra, which makes it even more exciting. <laughs> and, you know, I will just add a couple of points and happy to take your questions. But, you know, our level of engagement as we're projecting to be more involved really depends on the engagement of county agencies and departments in this process. Uh, and we are in the process of reaching out to, to departments about the next uh, legislative session. But just as an indication of the work we've done, uh, we have uh, done outreach to more than 50 departments within the county, talking about more than 1,033, I think 1,030 plus bills uh, over the last uh, few months. Uh, and uh, we are... Uh, also making sure that we're uh, educating the, the, the county uh, on how the process, the legislative process works. We began that uh, working closely with the leadership, the senior leadership of the administration through the executive leadership circle that we did a training on. We did a training for county council and grateful to uh, our county council and his staff who are very you know, important partners in all of this work. And uh, we're doing trainings for public health, uh, for DESJ, for the OBA. And again, you know, their engagement uh, is really uh, key to our success. Uh, and in the near, you know, in the next few weeks, we'll be meeting to talk to them about uh, the next legislative session, identifying priorities. And one thing that we will be doing as we're working with our county executive in the near future for this committee is that we will put forward the first ever work plan for uh, IGR. Uh, and uh, again, you know, we're very excited about where we are. One thing that we will be doing, uh, this is not related to, to the state, but as you probably have been reading in the paper, uh, there is unfortunately a very like, uh, it's very likely that we'll have a federal government shutdown. So we'll be providing some information to the county executive uh, about that and, and we'll keep you posted. So with that, I'm happy to take your questions and again, grateful uh, for all of the work that has been done and to the incredible staff of IGR who have made that happen. Thank you, David. I do have a couple of follow-up questions of what you just mentioned, so I'll just go dive into it. Um, first, on this SB 43, could you clarify, is that being passed or is it being pushed down for two years? What's going on on that it, one? It has been passed and it's just uh, right now, you know, waiting formal signature, but that will go forward. You expect the governor to sign it, right? Yes. It hasn't yeah. been signed yet. Then the other one I did hear was the relate to our county specifically with this ranked choice voting that I believe was passed. Uh, yes, that was passed. And I'm sorry, I forgot to add that, but that's also moving forward. Awaiting for signature. Yeah, awaiting for signature. Okay. And we work closely with uh, Assembly Member Lowe to make some technical amendments that we thought were helpful. And, and of course, you know, uh, grateful that he carried that. Okay, just those two clarifications. Yes, Vice Chair, uh, questions on this? Uh, first, uh, a really massive thank you to to David for energizing and 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 really charging up our county's entire footprint around intergovernmental relations, particularly with regard to um, the this engagement with the with the state delegation. I have tremendous appreciation as well to Jenny and Josh in Sacramento, to Danielle here. Uh, and James for really being uh, such a willing and eager partner to engage on all of these issues, to understand the fundamental importance of relationship building. I think we are incredibly fortunate with, our, with the members of our delegation. I don't know that many counties can say that they have an excellent relationship with every single one of their members. Uh, but we do, and that's something. And the fact that we got them all in one room at the same time and that they thought that was a good thing um, was, was pretty great. Um, I, I think also, particularly around the um, MHSA expansion um, 
Eggman's conservatorship bill, while we did not get everything we wanted, we made a significant impact and our voices were heard and I think almost most substantively, um, uh, although you know, I'm, I'm frankly very disappointed that we weren't able to move Senator Eggman away from or back to a co-occurring requirement, she heard our expert our subject matter experts speak, we had the access and we did everything we could on our end to make a very cogent and what should have been compelling argument. But that, to, we won't always win. But the fact that we will always be in there with our A game and our A team, I think is really critical. And what we need now, um, in addition to yes, a work plan, is consistency. Consistency in the relationships, consistency in communication, consistency in sharing our narrative, both to demonstrate where we are leading and to make sure that people, the various committees as well as legislators in and out of our delegation know to come to Santa Clara County um, for our subject matter expertise. And I think our, our work as well with the other county IGR teams as well as with UCC and CSAC will continue to be um, very important. And I think we need to use our role as the largest county in, in the Bay Area, in Northern California, and however you want to define it to, to really have an impact, to make sure that our voices continue to be heard and that that impact and influence uh, grows. So that's the speech, the very easy short question is, do you expect any opposition to Cortesi's um, ex extension of our sales tax? I don't, option? President okay. Allenberg through the chair. I don't expect any opposition. Uh, and you know, we, we haven't heard anything. We have had conversations, uh, but you know, we will remain diligent until uh, it actually goes through. Of course. Uh, yeah. And you know the one thing that I that I would say is you know that that we want to work you know elaborate and do more of is is just educating Sacramento, but all the great work that's happening in Santa Clara and the communications piece is really important, and you know kudos to President Allenberg for nudging us in that direction as well. Uh, CSAC presents an opportunity to do that, as you know the CSAC uh, awards process closed. And I'm happy to report that we had 13 different entries from the County of Santa Clara. Uh, Did you say 13 or 30? 13, 13. 13, that's fine, good. Yeah, 13, <laughs> which you know is, is, I think, as large as we've had. And it's an opportunity to educate Sacramento, irrespective of what happens with the awards, on the very cutting edge work that is being done throughout the county. Exactly, so I'm sure you're totally on top of getting one pagers for all of those. Yes those programs and thank you for for mentioning comms because our words are only as powerful as other people hear them so i really would like to see our opa involved in the work plan having a good strategic understanding of all of the things that we want to accomplish and i think the more they understand the holistic picture of what we're being asked to do rather than you know, being given one-off tasks, create this, create that. Um, I think we'll we'll have a much more seamless and and really impressive um, set of messages. So that's my additional plug. And again, David, thank you very much for thank for this work. That's all on this end. Okay, great. Um, do we have any public would like to speak on this item today? We do not. All right, the public is quiet today. So I'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Uh, one other item I want to bring up, um, AB 1329, I'm not sure you're tracking this one because it's not ours, uh, regarding a uh, assembly member of Mineshine from San Diego spill. Uh, it's about uh, working with the county sheriff's department uh, of those incarcerated to basically in the DMV uh, the ability to implement a pilot program to ensure eligible incarcerated individuals uh, are provided a valid identification card or driver's license when they are released from a county detention facility. Uh, so I thought this is a great idea. I asked um, uh, Sheriff Johnson how we deal with this issue. 
Uh, and the answer I got back basically is that they are trying to provide some type of uh, uh, connection with DMV. Um, so the good news is that there is a service being provided to Juvenile Hall by the DMV, uh, but the DMV stated they are unable to accommodate this on-site um, uh, service uh, and are trying to develop some type of online portal to be an option in the future. So short of going to write a new bill to make it a pilot project, I'm going to ask you and asking County Exec uh, if this is something that we could work locally with our DMV here to see if we could try to get that implemented for our uh, our county uh, uh, facilities uh, for those who are going to reentry from being released from our, our uh, detention facility so that uh, this, this could actually happen in the near future. Is this something that's doable? We can, well, definitely can look into it. And what was the bill number again? The bill number is 13, uh, AB 1329. And, and if I may, uh, we actually have looked into that yes. uh, through the chair, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. It is, uh, unfortunately, it's a, it's a five-year pilot that's specific for San Diego. San Diego. Right. Uh, so we're, try we're trying to figure out if there's a way that we can include Santa Clara County as part of the pilot, uh, but we can also explore what what options are available and of course you know if the only option is you know to pursue something legislatively in the next session we will make sure that we keep you informed and, and consider that option as well right exactly so basically i'm trying to before we do that which of course is an option i would like to see internally we could work this ourselves uh, with our local dmv and and our, our state delegation we can make that happen that'll be great if not then we'll do it the long way great but we're definitely looking into that, and and uh, we'll be we'll keep you informed. Absolutely, thank you. And as, as we all know, the reason why this is such a big deal, whether for those who are being released from our facility, or even many of those in non house facility uh, community, not having a identification, not having a driver's license, a huge impediment to everything in life, uh, housing, jobs. Uh, it, you know, the, the list goes on. So I think if these are things that we could be uh, making it available, you know, getting getting back to our community is, is never easy. Our housing cost is very high. So every little bit that we could help to make that happen, I think is uh, absolutely crucial for people to help get back on their feet and reduce recidivism for one thing, right? So, yes, Vice Chair? Yeah. All right, we have a motion. Actually, do we? I don't think we need a motion, do we, on this one? No. No. Okay. So it just received a ver great verbal report. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Awesome Thank work. you very Thank much. You. All right. Uh, I think we are moving to the uh, end of the agenda today. Uh, I believe our next meeting is currently scheduled for October 19th at 2 p.m. And if that's the case, I'll go ahead and call that meeting is now adjourned at 3.38. Thank you very much.